Are you getting ready to study abroad in Seoul, South Korea? Do you want to hear in-depth, maybe too in-depth commentary by a girl whose entire personality is that she also studied abroad in Seoul, South Korea? Well, if so, you've clicked on the right video. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Hi, if you're new here, my name is Lynn, and this is my channel. I studied abroad in South Korea in the past academic year, which is what most of my channel has been about. I made vlogs while I was over there, I've made a packing guide, and so this is another uh, video <laughs> from this series of my life about studying abroad in South Korea. It's been about a half a year since I returned, which is really crazy to think about because I was only there for four months in comparison. It's been 10 months since I initially left, so I know that around this time last year, I was still asking a bajillion questions to alumni who had studied abroad before me to get clarification on the process at the time, which for me was getting my visa, finding or officializing housing, signing up for classes, and then just general life in South Korea. And as much as my university's like study abroad center was pretty resourceful, at the end of the day, they have so many programs and so many students and so few advisors that they can't really be experts in every single country, every single program. So the most beneficial conversations I've had, the best resources were alumni who had just previously gone and studied abroad and come back. And so I want to be that source as much as I can for those of you who are clicking on this video, I assume it's because you're studying abroad and you have a bunch of questions that sometimes are hard to answer without feeling like you're in a conversation with someone. So I'm hoping this video can be relatively comprehensive on as much as I can cover. Oh, um, let me address this little setup. So as you might've noticed for the past few minutes, I have not been showing my face on camera. You're just watching like a torso talk. And that's simply because at the moment, I don't show my face on my channel. That's a yet. I might in the future, I don't know. But for the moment, I do want to hold onto that bit of privacy. But I figured it would be kind of boring to listen or watch a video of someone talking to you, but like you can't even see my face. It might not be very expressive. You know, I'm trying my hardest with these flailing arms, but I thought, how can I make that more interesting? So it kind of evolved into this idea of I will talk to you while I make Korean like picnic food and then when I'm done making my little picnic I'm gonna meet up with one of my friends Allison who is studying abroad in the fall in South Korea ultimately she's in the same position as I think many of you are who are watching so I'm hoping that when I meet with her and of course we're gonna talk about a lot of like the miscellaneous general things about like being in South Korea hopefully she kind of acts as maybe a proxy to the things that you're wondering while we talk. So that's the plan. That's the reason for why I'm in my kitchen. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are too. Um, but yeah, let's get started. Also disclaimer, I know that the title or something is gonna be like literally everything that you need to know before going to South Korea. Obviously it can't be literally everything. I will try my best to kind of talk on a lot of points, which I'm quite a rambly person, so maybe that'll backfire. So please leave some questions, further comments, etc., that you would like me to address, and I'll try my best to help, or maybe I'll make a future video with more questions to answer, but I'll try to cover as much as I can, at least foundationally. These videos are definitely gonna be on the longer side, so I will have timestamps to mark um, what questions I'm answering, what topics I'm talking about, and I'll also have a like CC transcript that you can follow along with that might be easier to digest. Without any further ado, let's get started! Okay, hello everyone. So I've switched to a voiceover just because I found it very difficult to talk while I was actually cooking. So if you see my hands moving around while I'm cooking, it's probably because I was talking at that moment, but I'm just gonna do a clean voiceover and we'll get started. All right, so first things first, you need to find a program to apply to study abroad through, right? But this can vary a lot depending on where you are, your university, what country you're from, if you're interested in just the language course, what kind of major you have, etc, etc, etc. So I'm not really going to talk very in depth about this because I assume you know where to turn for your resources. Speaking very generally, if you're a university student hoping to do an exchange program like I did, I recommend going to your school study abroad resources or your academic advisor to let them know that you're interested and see where they would refer you to. A lot of schools have their own in-house exchange programs as mine does, but some might use third-party programs like CIEE. There's a lot of options out there, so I would take a look at those if you haven't already. But for points in this video where I'm talking about your application, 
I will be referring to my specific experience as a UCEAP exchange student, and all other things I'm talking about can kind of apply to generally if you are looking at studying abroad in South Korea. Okay, so once you've figured out what program you'd like to study abroad through, you'll need to apply, you know? <laughs> uh, some places might be pretty competitive to obtain a spot. I know that with UCEAP, the applications were typically aligned with the host university's applications, so everything that would be required for each application or each school could be different. Some places asked for essays, professor recommendations, and others just needed you to apply to UCEAP, basically saying that you want to reserve a spot for yourself and that you intend to go. And that was the case for Yonsei as a UCEAP student. So if you're applying through UCEAP, again, you have to be aware of any start or due dates for your application and what those required documents for the application are. Some programs, I think all Korea programs for UCEAP are considered competitive programs, which means that there's limited spots. So essentially, they determine who gets to go kind of on a first come first serve basis. Um, you just have to apply before all the spots are gone. Yonsei was a limited program, so I made sure I got all of my necessary information for the application ready before the opening date. And then I basically like copied and pasted all of that information I'd prepared into the application. So I got my application in within like 20 minutes of it opening, I think. You don't have to be this extreme. Like I know it's not that competitive, but it, it gave me comfort to know that I must have been one of the first people to get it in so that I was secure. Okay, so for the app, here are a couple things I prepared on a separate document for all of the information I knew it was going to ask for. First, I think it asks for a copy of your unofficial transcript and then a picture of your passport, I think. The documents that they asked for were really like normal things that you should already have on hand. It was the other information that like once you open the app, there would be text boxes to fill out that I wanted to prepare beforehand. Some of the first questions were like, how do you plan on financing this program? And all it really needed was a short answer to show that you're considering it. Like there's really no like right or wrong answer for most of these questions. They just need to see that you have considered it and you've planned it and you've like worked out theoretically how you're going to fit studying abroad into your degree. It asked for my social security number, my passport information, and that's something that you definitely need to have on hand. You are going to need a passport that doesn't expire within six months of your return date. So if you don't already have a passport or you know that you're going to need to renew it, I would do it around this time that you are applying. When you apply initially, it's typically like in November or something. It's pretty early into the year before you have to do like official Yonsei applications later on and doing your visa and stuff like that at least six months later. So you don't have to worry about having your passport right then and there when you apply, but you need to make sure that you are in the process of getting one so that when you are applying with your official information to get your visas and stuff like that later, you already have a set passport. It also asks for emergency contact information, which I needed to input at least one non-parent option. And then for student information, it asks for like basically your status, the date you entered UC, your class status, when you'll be abroad, your anticipated graduation date, and then like all of your units completed, how many are in progress, how many are remaining, how many will be completed later. Like you just have to give them all those numbers. This next bit is the thing that took a lot of time and that I wouldn't recommend waiting for until after the app opens. They ask for your class plans, which means literally every single class that you plan to take in that academic year and the next year while you're abroad, they want you to list them and say what classes they are, how many units they are, basically to demonstrate that you have planned out how you're going to attain the rest of your required units to be on track for graduation. It asks for the course name, the course number, the unit count, and the course code. It doesn't have to be accurate, like they're not actually asking for you to say this is exactly what I'm going to take. You can't possibly do that because we don't even know what classes are offered like a year in advance, right? They just need to see that you have a plan and that you've considered, okay, I have these requirements left, this is when I'm going to take it. Like they just need to see that you have thought this through. It's going to take a while, and this is just something that I knew a lot of people tried to do while they were opening the app. And like, it's not going to make you so far behind that you're not going to get a spot, but it takes a while, so I would recommend doing this beforehand. I looked back to the document that I'd prepared when I was applying, and this is all that I had listed on there, so I assumed that the rest of the application was very simple, like personal information, like your name, your address, that kind of stuff that I didn't really have to prepare beforehand, I already knew. 
And then as for the acceptance timeline, I applied when it opened. For me, that was November 1st, I think. And I was notified of my quote-unquote acceptance within six weeks or so, which was earlier than they said it would be. I say acceptance in quotes because technically it's more like your spot has been saved or they've recognized, they've nominated your submission. So they're basically saying, you know, you obviously still have to go through the rest of the process, apply through to Yonsei, get your visa, et cetera, et cetera, before you're technically confirmed to be going abroad. But your spot to do all of that has been saved and you are in the clear, which is what you need. For all the remaining steps of the application, it's very straightforward. You'll get emails to do something or another like every couple months. So keep checking your email regularly, but it was just the application initially that I felt like I had some comments to give since at that point, the study abroad center can't always help you specifically if they don't have an attendant who's done your specific program. Afterwards, there was an application that we had to do again directly to Yonsei where they basically asked for some of the same documents that you initially submitted, like your personal information, your passport info. The only real difference I remember is that they wanted an ID photo and they also had a few short answer questions to answer, but those weren't super strict. Like again, they're not looking to reject your application. It's kind of a formality just to consider it a sort of official application. I think I wrote about three paragraphs for each question and they were super straightforward, like classic things that you would ask for a study abroad student, like, why did you want to study abroad with this program? Okay, so now we're getting into more of the like actually important things. So obviously, like I've mentioned before, everyone's potentially going through different programs. So I'm not sure what kind of information each of those give out to their participants, but I suggest obviously following whatever they recommend, but it's still good to know what your options or what other people are doing generally for this process. So one of the big questions, one of the big concerns is what to do for housing. Yonsei itself and my UCEAP program sent out info for applying to like the dorms specifically. I think it was around April and I assumed that your program would do the same thing. It would be kind of crazy if they didn't give you any housing information. So take whatever they give you and look through that and see it, what you want to do. But I'm going to talk about what happened with me. So firstly, there was the dorm option. At Yonsei, there are two dorms for study abroad students. There's International House or I House and SK House. SK House was the preferred option for many people because it was newer. So the facility itself was just nicer, but they're both located in the same place. Distance doesn't really make a difference. The one other main difference was that I House was an all girls dorm. So if you're a guy, SK House is your only option. Like there's no other choice for you. But if you're a girl, you can consider both iHouse and SK House. So SK House is technically co-ed compared to iHouse, but the thing is all floors are separated by gender and they're really strict about keeping that and staying only on your floor. So it's not really co-ed. Like I knew some friends who were helping like opposite sex friends get back to their dorm after a night out. Um, and that's a discussion for later, but they got a warning for that. Like there's someone monitoring the front, which makes sense. They have security and stuff like that, but really they're also monitoring you specifically they're monitoring the cameras at like the entrance and at the elevators for every single floor so that they can see who gets off the elevator and the people monitoring like they saw that my friends were sim like it's not like they hung out in their room they literally got off the elevator to help someone get into their room and then left within seconds and even that got them a warning Oh, and speaking of the monitor, like they don't allow guests. So if you have friends who aren't living in the same accommodation, you're not gonna be able to bring them up with you. I think they used to have a curfew for students, but they got rid of that a few years ago. So if that's something that you were worried about, you don't have to think about that anymore. That's all I can think of for the dorms. I, obviously they'll give you more specific information if that's even an option that they're giving you. You know, if they want students to sign up for the dorms, they're gonna give you the information that you need, like the prices and when you need to apply and stuff like that. But I personally found a place to live off campus, independent from the dorms and I kind of ind independent from the school. So there are a few reasons why I initially chose to do that. And then a few more reasons upon like reflection that I think made that the right choice for me that I wanted to address. So the first main reason that I even considered off campus instead of the dorms is that the dorm application was known to be competitive. So things like the site crashing because everyone flocks to it and everyone's fighting for like these limited spots um, made me a little bit nervous about relying on getting a dorm. So I found a living tell or Goshiwan style listing on Airbnb that was in the heart of downtown Shincheon and it was only a few blocks away from the Yonsei gates like in one direction and then the same distance in the other direction was the Shincheon like line two station. 
So I kind of, I did my research, you know, I looked around at different places. Airbnb is obviously a really easy one to find like long-term housing. But honestly, if you're looking for Goshi ones, like a lot of Goshi ones, like you can show up, say, I'm looking for a place. Can I tour, look at what the rooms would be like and say, I'm going to book this place for this month or however long. Like that's something that you can do. That's just not my style because I kind of need to have everything planned. And it definitely helps if you know Korean already or you have someone there to help you if you're doing that. So I opted for just booking a place on Airbnb. So anyway, I decided I liked this particular listing that I found. I looked at a lot of them, but this one kind of worked out perfectly. So I booked it even before the dorm application opened since it had a flexible cancellation policy that would have let me cancel it up to a month before my move-in date, which meant that if I wanted to apply for the dorms, I could have done that. And if I got my spot, I could have canceled this apartment and it would have been totally fine. The thing is, though, that when it came time to apply for the dorms, I kind of just decided I didn't really want to try because I liked this option that I'd secured and I didn't really want to deal with the actual application itself anyway. Like, I already knew I had housing and I was happy with it. Most of the people I knew who applied for the dorms actually did get a spot, so I don't know if it's as competitive as people make it sound, but at the same time, I did know some people who didn't make it and needed to find some other place. So if that's you, you don't have to worry, like there will be options and there will definitely be people on like the discords for Yonsei or study abroad, like look for those, find those sites. You know, there's a lot of people I saw a few months before we left who were like, we have two people, we're looking for two other people for like a four person Airbnb to share. If anyone's interested, please reach out. It's kind of the same as like when you're finding roommates for college initially, I think that sort of like screening people to see if it works or not, but there will definitely be other options if you don't get a dorm space. Looking back, I'm really glad I did what I did because of a couple reasons. So first, like I mentioned, the location was actually really great and it was more convenient than the dorms at Yonsei. So actually, I guess to forward that, the campus, Yonsei campus is a bit, it's beautiful and maybe it's actually not that strange for people, but it's quite inconvenient to walk around because there's really only one main road and then sections of the campus branch off from that. But if you want to get from one end to another and like there's no way for you to cut through effectively, like there are no paths for you to cut through anywhere. You have to go along and walk this however many miles to get to a certain point on campus. So the dorms are off to like this one side of campus that really you can't cut through any way to get to your classes other than to walk up and down the main road and then branch off to where you have to go or to literally come down to hit the street, the main street, and walk to the front gates and then walk through campus. So it could take like 20 to 30 minutes for you to get to class from the dorms. But my location was like five minutes away from the main gates. And then, you know, from the main gates, you might walk another 10 minutes or whatever. But ultimately, that kind of made it more convenient. Like it only took me five minutes to get to the main gates as a starting spot instead of walking 15 minutes to get to the main gates from the dorms and then walk another 15 minutes to get to class or something. And then I was also only a five minute walk, not even five minutes, honestly, from the line to subway station in Shincheon, downtown Shincheon. So it was a really convenient spot for me, like at night, like let's say we were out with friends or I was just traveling in general, right? I was moving around a lot. Like I was close to the transportation hubs, whereas the dorms, there were only a couple bus lines that went there. And if you were to walk from the subway station, it would definitely take like 20 minutes. So for me, location was just perfect and I didn't know that very well when I booked it like I was aware of the location but I didn't know in real life you know in practice with routine how much time it might take to get from one place to another and it turns out my place was way more comfortable than the dorms also the actual location itself like I mentioned was like in downtown Shincheon area so it's with all these different restaurants karaoke places pubs anything that people are gonna go visit which Shincheon is like a student area it's a student neighborhood so Everyone, when they go out with their friends, like you're walking through Shincheon to begin with, if not eating there. So it was a really convenient location for me because I was usually like three to five minutes away from wherever we wanted to meet up. In fact, the karaoke bar and like pocha that we went to the most often was across the street from my place. Like I would literally take 20 steps to get to my front door. So that was really convenient for me. Secondly, there's just a bit more ease or freedom. Like it's not with the school. There's no monitors like... I couldn't bring guests up because of just security, which is a good thing. Not that there would be any room because Goshi ones are really tiny, but the fact that I wasn't like being monitored with the school and that there wasn't anything I could do at my living space that would somehow like 
like that would be an infraction or something to my stay there as a student not that I would have done anything but I guess it was just like this relief that there wasn't some other entity like monitoring me you know from the school that kind of made it nicer and then also I liked that this ghost one was like a single room even though it was a communal floor and we had a communal kitchen I'm not sure that the dorms had a kitchen they might have the thing about these Gosha ones, though, is that they are pretty small, typically. You will obviously see on your listing what the room looks like. My place was really small, comparatively, but it had its own bathroom, which is all I really cared about. And honestly, like, the space didn't really bother me. I was totally okay with it. So, if that's something that bothers you, then maybe you need to consider that. But I think the dorms are a pretty small size, too, for dorms. They're not as small as my place was, but they're still pretty small for dorms. Anyway, at the end of the day, I just found that the location, the ease and freedom, um, and then the fact that it was like a single room, my own bathroom, all of that really made for this particular place that I booked kind of the best case scenario for me. And I'm, I'm really glad that I did that. So I definitely recommend looking at all of your options and considering maybe what are the pros and cons for everything. The dorms are definitely obviously easy, like you're doing it through the university and you'll, f you'll meet more people that way. I, that is something that was kind of a con for me is that all of my friends lived in the dorm, so if they all went to like run to the convenience store, which is on the first floor of the dorms, they would do that. And obviously I wouldn't have been invited. Like they hung out more casually like that, that I wasn't a part of. But I never felt really left out by my friends. But that's something like that, where like socially, if you're not around them all the time, you might feel a little bit left out or it's harder. I personally, for who I am and what my experience was, the, the Goshiwan that I stayed in was completely fine. And in fact, preferred, I think. All right, so the next big thing I think is getting your visa. And for me, I'm pretty sure this came next in the process. I did all of my application stuff. It was pretty quiet for a few months. I got my housing probably around in May. And then the next step was getting your visa pretty early into the summer with only a few months before leaving. Obviously your school, your program or whatever should be sending out information about this because otherwise how are they sponsoring you to get there, you know? But I just have a couple comments aside from do whatever it is that they're telling you to do. Yonsei sent me the information about where I needed to go, what documents to bring with me um, in like one email. And that email came before they sent the actual documents that I would need for this visa appointment. So they didn't tell us exactly when they were going to do it. We just knew that it would probably be like mid to late June. So I booked an appointment at my closest embassy, which is the one in L.A., um, and I had the option of going in person because it's right here for me. But some people might just have to mail in their documents, which is also totally fine. You just need to account for like the time it takes to mail something in and get it back. And also to make sure that all of your documents are really in order because I think it'd be really frustrating to send it in and realize that something's missing or something's wrong. And then you'd have to do it again by like mailing it and that would just take a lot more time. The second they sent the email with all of the documents that I needed, I booked an appointment at the LA Embassy. And luckily there was a spot for like the next week open, but I would do it ASAP because those spots are gonna fill up and you definitely need to get that visa, you know, like within time. The list of required forms is available on the Embassy website and they refer you to that, but it's kind of like an old janky looking website, not gonna lie. So according to the documents that I saved in my like visa file on my computer, the documents I brought were the copy of the consul appointment confirmation, which I needed when I checked in, my visa application form, which is found on the website, an ID picture to the Korean dimensions, my UCEAP participation letter, the certificate of admission, the university's welcome letter, and the Yonsei business registration certificate. All of those three were the documents that Yonsei specifically needed to send to me at the end of June. The other documents are things that like I can pull or that UCAP already gave to me in advance. Um, it was just those last three that I needed to wait on before I could take my stuff to the appointment. For your ID picture, you know, it's pretty standard. Get them done wherever you can get like passport photos done because you do need them to like another country's passport dimensions. I did mine at AAA. If you're a member, AAA has like all the country's dimensions. So if you just tell them, oh, I need this for a South Korean visa, can I get those dimensions? Like they'll cut them out for you that way. The D2 student visa is a single entry visa and it only gives you a span of 90 days. So that means you have 90 days since the issuing of your visa to enter South Korea before it expires. And then once you enter, you cannot leave without getting an ARC card or getting another visa. Like if you leave, you're just going to have to apply for another visa and go again. So make sure you schedule getting that visa so that you don't get it issued over three months before your entry date. That's probably not going to be a problem because I think they really only give you the documents with three months to go. 
And then make sure that you plan to go in and then stay there until you get your ARC, which is probably going to take another six weeks or so once you're in Korea. So the ARC is something I typically would talk about for after you're in Korea, but since we're already here talking about the visas, I'm just going to talk about it here as well. The ARC stands for the Alien Registration Card, or it's basically your foreign residency card. I think they're trying to distance themselves from the term alien, but it's still being referred to as the ARC. You need this card, essentially, to leave and return to the country without a visa. Anyone who is staying in the country for longer than three months is required legally to get it, so you have to apply for this and make sure that you will have it issued or before the three months of your stay are up. It can typically take like a month and a half or so to get it done, so you want to get that appointment in as soon as possible. The school offers a couple services to do it like as a group. They will give that information out and say like, hey, if you want to do your ARC through this program with us, like we have people coming in, they'll help you fill out the forms, they'll take all of your stuff and they will submit it. And I think you pay a little bit of a fee. And I think it also takes a little bit longer maybe than if you were to do it on your own. But the ease and convenience of doing it through an organization that kind of handles it for you is definitely something to consider. I know a lot of people found it worth it and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But I kind of wanted to just get it done ASAP. So I just booked an ARC appointment on my own to do by myself. The school will tell you what district office you need to be booking this in because this depends on the address of your school or where you're staying. For Yonsei, it was at the Nambu Immigration Branch, which is right by Kimpo Airport. Uh, it was about like a 40-minute train or bus ride there, and I didn't mind going there on the day for the appointment and going again to pick it up, so I just took that trip by myself. But again, that's another thing that maybe you just don't want to do. In like the webinars that they did in this pre-departure stage, they kind of they talked about the ARC obviously, and they said that you can only book this appointment when you are in Korea. But it turns out that like at least last year we didn't have to do that. Like you could book an appointment without being in Korea yet. So I don't know if maybe that was just something for last year, or if they just recently changed it. But I was able to book an ARC appointment while I was still in the U.S. I also needed ID photos for this application, so. I took the photos that I used for my passport, but when I arrived in Korea, I also just took a couple more there. There's plenty of ID like photo booths in Korea. If you're at Yonsei, there's definitely one in the student center. I'm sure most universities do because they need these commonly. Like people put ID pictures on their resume and stuff like that. So having ID photo booths is really common over there. I see them in train stations. Like Shincheon Station has an ID photo booth as well. So like you'll find them. So I took those and I also brought them with me along with all of the other documents which I needed. So that was like the ARC form and then my proof of the appointment again, my certificate of enrollment at Yonsei, and I'm pretty sure I also brought my proof of residency. So again, your school will give you all this information, but I just brought like literally every single document that I could ever think of with me and I think they only took like those four that I mentioned. When I got there, I just kind of waited in the waiting room for the sign to turn whatever number that I was, and I walked up to the window, I sat there, and the woman knew what she was doing very quickly. She was like, okay, I just need these, these, these. I didn't have to even say anything, I think. She just went through, marked everything, and she was like, okay, you're set to go, here's your receipt. Would you like to pick it up, or would you like to have it mailed to you? And I just chose to pick it up. Okay, and speaking of leaving the country, or just moving around the country, I guess, when it comes to plane tickets, so I'm talking about plane tickets to get over to Korea in the first place. When it comes to plane tickets, you know, everyone has like their own strategy, their own system when it comes to booking tickets, so this is just my comments on the process for me. First of all, I wanted to book in advance as much as possible. You know, a lot of people say like three months is actually an ideal time to book for flights because the prices go down or whatever. That's up to you. I think three months is probably around the time most people will book anyway, given that your housing, your visa, all that kind of stuff is not really set to be confirmed until like June. And I think our program advisors were like, we want you to wait until everything is confirmed before booking your flight. So it kind of ended up being like maybe two months in advance is when people could technically officially be confirmed. I did not want to wait that long. I was not willing to push that back. So I booked in advance. I booked in May, I think. It was probably late May, which is earlier than I was told, obviously. But it was a flexible ticket with like revision options, cancellation options. And I just really needed a date to know what I was expected to be in Korea so that I could plan everything else. So when it comes to housing, you know, I can't plan those dates without knowing when I'm going to be in Korea. Planning my ARC appointment and stuff like that. Like I knew at what point, like would I have been there for a week and I would have known how to go around there or whatever. Like, I just needed secure dates to plan everything else around, so I booked earlier than I was recommended to, I guess. But I don't think there's really anything wrong with that as long as you know what kind of ticket you're getting. As for tickets, another thing people need to consider is do you want to do a one-way or round-trip ticket? 
I think if you're going for a short length of time, so if you're doing like a summer program or even yes, just a semester, like a round trip is definitely less hassle. Some people wait to book their return once they're over there if they want to consider extending. You know, if you're someone who's going abroad for a year, you probably are just doing a one way ticket because plans can change. And, you know, sometimes tickets aren't even offered for dates over a year in advance. I personally just did a one way ticket because at the time when I booked it, like I knew when I wanted to be there. But I didn't have a set plan really for coming back. I didn't know what my finals would be like. I didn't know yet if maybe I wanted to stop in Japan, if I wanted to stop somewhere else. So I just booked my ticket into Korea. It's definitely possible to coordinate these flight plans with people if you want to. Again, like I mentioned before, there are discords. So there's people on there that like make documents saying this is the flight like from this airport. I'm leaving on this date, this is the flight number. If there's other people who are interested in doing that, like we can all meet up at the airport, get to know each other quickly and then get on the flight so we technically have like a flight buddy or something. That's If that's something that you're looking for, like there are options for that. And I would look at those before you book your flight. I also think a lot of people are curious about planning like a trip before school starts and that's something I did as well. If you've seen any of my vlogs, you might have seen that I traveled to Jeju Island, Busan, and Gyeongju before I did anything in Seoul before the school year started. What I did there was I arrived a week earlier than our necessary arrival date. My program said that we had to be there a week before the term or classes started because the orientation was that Monday. So I needed to be in Seoul by that Monday and I planned to get to Seoul, I think it was like a week and a half at that point, um, so that I had time to settle into Seoul and then I had a week for traveling and then I would be back in Seoul for that first Monday of our program. I decided to do this just because I wanted extra time to explore and travel, and I didn't know how much time I would actually have during the school year to do that, so I wanted to guarantee I had this full week. I wasn't a student yet, I was just settling into Korea and exploring it really as a tourist for like the first five days or so. Domestic plane flights are actually pretty cheap in Korea, at least comparatively, like as an American speaking, is pretty cheap. But booking them online with my foreign credit card was really difficult for like regional or domestic airlines. So what I ended up having to do was book my flight to Jeju and then from Jeju to Busan. I had to book it through Asiana, which is an international airline, so it was at a higher price. Um, but I just couldn't deal with the hassle of trying to work out like booking on Jeju Airlines or something because they just weren't accepting my foreign credit card. I think if you're physically in Korea, it's possible maybe to call them or something like that and you would get those tickets for much cheaper. But that's kind of what I had to do because I was still in the US. I did all of this solo, by the way, as well. So, so I was just booking plane flights for one person. I was just booking accommodation for one person, which led me to booking like hostels, really. I was booking hostels just based on reviews, you know, be smart. I wanted to see safety. I needed to see location. And I just booked places that felt reliable. Even if it was a little bit more expensive, it was still not as expensive as like, let's say a hotel. So if you're really interested in solo travel, I definitely recommend doing in Korea. It's safe, it's really accessible. Even in places where the public transportation is not as good, it's still possible to get around. And at the very least, you can call a taxi. Like that's totally possible to do as a foreigner as well. So if you're interested in solo travel, I definitely, definitely recommend doing it. it became my favorite thing to do while I was over there and I was really nervous about it because this is my first week in Korea you know I was planning a solo trip in this country where I didn't know anything yet and like even just in the first few days where I was in Seoul just settling in I recognized like how capable I was of doing this solo travel at least in Korea so if you're interested I definitely recommend it. Another note another recommendation honestly that I have for travel in Korea whether it's domestically or just in Seoul, because Seoul has so many things to explore, is to do so much research before you go. I know this is like an obvious thing to say, it's a pretty redundant point, but do your research in all the ways that you can. So read a bunch of travel guides, look up like big landmarks, look up, you know, like I watched a lot of vlogs of people who live in Korea and people who were studying abroad in Korea, people who were traveling to Korea, like all these different perspectives and what people found interesting. And I watched a bunch of those, I read a bunch of vlogs and I marked every single place that even vaguely interested me on Naver Maps, which I will mention later when I talk about apps to download. So I did that where I literally for months, like the second I knew I was going to Korea, 
I started saving a bunch of places on neighbor maps. I downloaded neighbor maps and I saved literally everywhere that I could. At this point, my neighbor maps has like probably 300, 400 locations saved. But yeah, that's that's one of my major, major tips. Like even if you're a spontaneous traveler, you need to know of the places that you could go to that then you could be spontaneous and go to one day or something like that. You know, like if you don't know where you're going, if you don't know what your options are, what you want to explore, that time is just going to fly by and and you might have gone through four months without seeing as much as you wanted to or that as much as you thought you were going to. So definitely do that. That is my number one tip, honestly. And I think it was the number one thing that made me enjoy Seoul and South Korea as much as I could during those four months. I felt like I maximized my time and I had no regrets. One other thing about traveling one year in Korea is that, at least for me, my program had a portal for us to like record where we were going and what our plan is, our itinerary, so that they had a general idea of where we would be in case something happened. I think most programs should have something like that, but if they don't, tell someone at least, even if they're not in Korea, let someone know what your plan is in case something happens to you. As for packing, I do have a packing guide video, so I will refer you there. I go more further into what I actually packed in my other video if you would like to check that out. Another thing that you're going to do probably before you arrive is your class registration. Again, this is something that I can only speak to as a Yonsei exchange student, so if this doesn't apply to you, I apologize, but a couple things might be similar across your universities. But essentially, things that you should know is that at Yonsei, and I think a lot of Korean schools, is that class registration is a bidding process, which was really unfamiliar to me and I think unfamiliar to most people. But it's not like a first come first serve depending on your seniority type of thing. Seniority will matter, but it's not like you have a window to register. You can get all your classes and then move on. In this bidding process, every student at Yonsei is given 72 points. And you can use those to bid on classes that you want. And obviously the number of points that you bid indicates how badly you want to be in that class. A lot of these classes, you can look at like the course offerings and you can click on mileage for these classes that you're interested in to see what previous semesters looked like on this bidding process. You can see how competitive it was depending on like how many students applied versus how many spots there were. And then like for the students who did make it into the class, how many points did they wager? So for really competitive classes, let's say, if the max points that you can bid on is like 36, literally half of your points, a really competitive class might have like only 50 kids who get in and all 50 of those kids bid over 20 points or something like that. Like that will indicate to you how competitive it is to get into that class. Other classes are probably way bigger or super not competitive where like they don't even max out the class number or the people who made it in really only needed to bet like five points or something like that. Like that will tell you how competitive it is and how competitive you can anticipate this year's bidding to be. Some of these are like really competitive classes. You can even see that like the kid who got the last spot and the difference between the kid who was right after them is not even a matter of points, but rather a matter of seniority. So this is where seniority kind of matters. The priority for students when it comes to this bidding process is first of all, the number of bids. But after that, like especially for competitive classes, a lot of kids bid the same number of points. So after the number of points, it goes down to your seniority in grade. So if you're a senior, and a junior and you both bid the same number of points, the senior is going to have a slightly higher position on that list. And then it goes down the line. So there's a lot of other factors like it'll say grade. I think it says something like number of classes bid, uh, graduation year or major. Like it goes down to that to split the difference between people who are bidding the exact same points. I think it's pretty unnecessary to consider the later qualifications for dividing people. But the main things to consider are the actual points itself, your seniority, which you can't really do anything about, but the thing that you can do about, which comes after that, is the number of classes you've bid on. This is something that my program didn't really advise us on, and I had to be told by Yonsei students themselves that like, oh, the strategy is to bid for the maximum number of classes, which is six. Even in the first round, when you really only need to secure two classes. So the thing with Yonsei is that there's actually multiple rounds. There's a first round, a second round, and then I think a third round where like you just, the rest of the classes that are open and available, it's first come first serve. You just have to try and book the classes that you want if you haven't already gotten all the classes that you need. In the first round, I think you can only get up to two classes or three classes, but you can still bid for six classes. And what I was told is that the strategy is to bid for six classes but put most of your points into like the two or three that you want to get in that first round and then bid one point for like three throwaway classes that you don't intend to be in. But they push up your seniority by showing that you bet for six classes. 
So if I kind of explain it through my example, maybe it'll be a little bit clearer because a lot of this can be confusing. Um, but as a study abroad student, like I had fewer demands and I had the option of taking study abroad classes. So it's a little bit different than like resident students there. But I knew I needed two upper division regional history or politics class for my degree itself. Another thing to consider was that the minimum class requirement for my study abroad program was being enrolled in four classes. So I needed two upper div classes. I also wanted to take a language course and then I needed one other course just to fulfill my minimum course enrollment requirement. So initially I was looking for a class just for fun, but eventually I replaced that with an internship that I got, which I took for academic credit and that counted as my fourth class. Essentially what I decided to do was I looked through all the courses available, right? And I tried to see how competitive the ones that I wanted were. Luckily, one of the classes I wanted for my upper div requirement was super not competitive. Like they never even maxed out the class. So I bid only one point, I think, or maybe I bid like two or three just to be safe, but I bid very few points for that class and I saved the rest of them for the other classes. The language classes, you don't have to bid points. Like anyone who signs up for them gets in. So you don't have to worry about like wagering strategically there. So that was another one that was a really easy giveaway for me. I only needed to put down one point. Boom, there you go. I was enrolled in that class. So those two that I needed, I only had to bid like one point, honestly. Maybe I did like two or three for the other one that wasn't guaranteed technically, but I spent very few points there so that I could save all of my points for the one class that I really wanted that I knew would be more competitive. And that was this other upper div class that was not a study abroad class. So I was competing with a bunch of other like local resident students for this one class that only took like 30 people. So I bid the maximum number of points there, which was 36. And then with my remaining points, I spread them across all these other like classes that either I knew I was going to get with just a few points or that I didn't intend to enroll in. So my specific breakdown ended up being I bid the maximum number for my one like real competitive class which was 36. I bid around like 20 something points for this one popular study abroad class that I wanted. I spent most of my points like out of 72 I think I spent around 50 something on these two classes only. Then the rest of my points were spread out to classes that either I knew I didn't have to bid for I knew they weren't competitive or I didn't want to be in. I just wanted to apply for them so that it boosted my like applied classes to six. So I think I bid like five points for the non-competitive one just to be safe, even though I think I would have gotten in even if I'd bid only one point. I bid one point for the language class, which was unnecessary, but again, it counts as another class that I bid for. And then one class that was super popular, so I knew I wasn't going to get it, but I just bid one point so that it moved my classes up to six. And essentially, I got into all of the classes that I wanted. The only class I didn't get into was that really one popular class that I only bid one point for, but I didn't intend to get into that class, you know? So this really worked out for me. I think if your classes are more competitive, like if all of the ones that you're looking for are more competitive, you definitely need to be strategic. It can be quite a confusing thing to explain over video, but I did want to mention that like the number of classes you bid on helps with your priority, which is something that my program did not explain to us. Okay, we just have a couple more things to talk about to know before arriving in South Korea. First of all, like I mentioned before, there are a couple apps that you want to download, namely being like navigation and translation apps. There are a lot of apps that I was told to download as a Yonsei student, as someone who was in Korea, but many of them kind of went unused. So I'm just going to talk about the ones that I actually did use. If you're a Yonsei student, you probably want to get like the two main apps. One would be like YAttend, which is what you use for attendance if your classes are in person, which most of them probably are. Attendance is pretty strict. Your grade is dependent on them. And I think you're only allowed like five or six absences before you fail the class. So getting that attendance in through the app is really important. Even if you're physically there, sometimes they're gonna be really strict and say, well, you didn't do the app. So get that Why Attend app. And then secondly, there's like the portal for Yonsei. I think it's called like Learn Us. I never use the app, I just use it on the browser, but if you're someone who wants to use it on the app, that would be another app to have. But I didn't think any of the other Yonsei specific apps were necessary. Other apps that I used, the main one I used was Naver Maps. Like I mentioned before, I saved so many things on Naver Maps and I used it for everything, like figuring out my transportation, finding a bunch of locations to go to, like that's, I just did everything in Naver Maps. There's also the option of Kakao Maps. Kakao and Naver are like two major search engines in Korea. So both of them are totally fine. I initially started with Kakao, but I moved to Naver because I just found that I liked that style more. So I would download both 
take a look at them, how they work, and which one you would prefer. But I prefer Naver Maps. They also have like Naver bus, Naver train apps where you can specifically just use it to figure out what train route or what bus route you should take. I had friends who did that, but I you can also do that in the Naver Maps app itself. So I always just did it in the app and I never used the bus train apps. I just use Naver Maps. When it comes to translation apps, I recommend Papago. Google Translate is totally fine too, but Papago is a Korean translation app. It's made by a Korean company, so you're more likely to get accurate translations there. Those were literally the main two apps that I used, aside from like my Yonsei stuff. So a lot of these other apps that I'm going to mention are just like additional or things that are fun to potentially have. The first one would be the Darungi app. Darungi is like a bike rental service that you can do around the city. I did it a couple times across the Han River, which was really wonderful. So I recommend getting the app and creating a quick account. And it's really cheap to honestly rent these bikes. So that's something I recommend for your experience while you're abroad. Another one I used was the Buka Check app, which I used to check my T money card balance um, just in case I was like wondering if I needed a refill or something soon. I just quickly checked on the Buka Check app, which would just scan the card with your phone and tell you how much is on there, or how much you use that month, stuff like that. Also, there are a couple food delivery apps that I think people want to use. However, the thing is, for a lot of them, you kind of need like a Korean credit card or bank account to use them, or at the very least, you need your ARC to verify your phone number to order from because if it's not verified they're not going to let you purchase anything online so food delivery is something that you can't really do until you get your arc which is probably around two months into your stay and that's the same for any like online ordering service so even things like amazon which they don't have in korea it's actually um coupon instead that's kind of like their main amazon site but there are a couple other ones as well all of those you definitely need like a korean verified phone number first of all so you have to do that with your arc and then after that having a korean credit card or bank account it makes it a lot easier to order online so i found that i just never really did that speaking of verifying your phone number in the arc what to do about your sim card or getting network or something like that so for me what i decided to do was get a physical sim card I know a lot of like current phones that are coming out have like eSIM cards and I don't really understand. I'm going to be honest, I feel bad. I don't know anything I can offer for eSIM options because I did not have an eSIM card. I know there are a couple big carriers like LG where they have options for you to have like an eSIM download or some kind of phone plan. Some people even like buy a phone over there honestly to use, which is definitely an option, you know. But if you have a physical SIM card and your phone's been paid off, because that is something that you need to do before you can change out your SIM card. If you are doing a physical SIM card, I recommend, highly recommend the service that I use, which was Chingu Mobile. Basically, everyone I knew who was an alumni who used physical SIM cards recommended Chingu Mobile. And I have to agree that it was really easy, super affordable. I think I paid for like a four month program. I should have done like a five month just to be safe because I was technically there for like four and a half months, but I paid for like a four month SIM card service. I didn't do the premium. I just did the basic four month plan and it said that there were like limits to the megabytes that you could use, but I never had a problem with slow internet or even running out. A couple times it looked like it was telling me like, oh, you used all your data, but the thing is my data never slowed down. I never had slow internet. Like I would have never known what they were saying and it wouldn't have mattered. Like I asked my friends to translate and they were telling me, oh yeah, they're just saying you have this much credit or oh yeah, they're saying that you use this much. But the thing is it didn't affect my service at all. And I heard that from all the other people who are using it as well. So I totally recommend Chingu Mobile. You don't even have to splurge on the premium, like just the basic plan should cover you and it gives you totally reliable, fast internet. There are a couple options, like you can have it shipped to you in your location in Korea. You can go to a store to pick it up. There's also a booth at Incheon Airport to pick it up, which is what I did. Depending on what times that booth is open, maybe it'll align with your flight or not. So that's something I would check. Okay, finally, a couple miscellaneous things to mention before going that I'm sure your program will also tell you. Firstly, go and get a physical done or go get a checkup from your routine provider. I needed to go because for my program, they asked us to sign off from a medical provider to just say that we are capable of studying abroad, there will be no problems, like there's nothing physically or mentally that is a concern for my studying abroad, just health-wise. But let's say that they're not required, I still think you should go to your doctor because you might need to restock on medication that you need to take with you. You want to see that you're in good shape, like you are about to be in a foreign country, like it's it's good to, to get an assessment of how you are at that moment, right? 
And also when it comes to healthcare in Korea, you don't have to worry about that because the second you are there with an ARC card, you will automatically be enrolled into the national healthcare program. So every month or so, you will get a check in the mail that says this is how much you owe for the insurance. Secondly, alert your bank. You know, let the bank know if you're going to use the credit card that you are using with them that you will be abroad and that they shouldn't deny your credit card request because it will be you. It's not fraud. On that note, like check if your credit cards have international fees and maybe you want to open up a new credit card. I didn't have to do this, so I'm not entirely sure what process you might be, but I know a popular option that I saw a lot of people do was the Charles Schwab student credit card, which had no international fees. Finally, a very obvious thing, a very cliche thing, but it has to be said, study as much as you can. Like, study everything as much as you can. I know I've already mentioned studying, like, locations and tourist things to do, but more importantly, study the country itself. So study the culture, study their customs, study their history, study their laws, study the language. All of this goes without saying that you should put an effort because you are a guest in this host country and you should try your hardest to be respectful and to acknowledge the reality of this place. They are not some kind of vacation spot. They are not some fantastical like other world, other land. Like this is a country, a real country with real people, real culture. And it's not just like some distant fantasy thing that you are just exploring for fun, you know? Research what is considered polite or acceptable in that society. What are the laws? Um, Something like drugs and medicine, that's a really big deal over there. So when it comes to your medication, you might have to look and see what is legal or not legal. Obviously, the language is something that you need to study as much as you can. There is plenty of English around, especially in Seoul. Like, a lot of Koreans do know quite a bit of basic English, so it's okay if you need to rely on that. And in fact, if you're visibly a foreigner, they're just going to assume that you're American or they're just going to assume that you speak English. So maybe you don't have to worry about that so much, but still, study as much as you can. I think there's a couple things that are essential to know, like how to order things. That's something that you will always be doing, so definitely learn how to order food. But other than that, I think learning numbers for time, numbers for like what number bus, for prices, learning directions like where is like here versus there, going left, right, second floor, things like that, just to know when people are are describing where to go are pretty survival basic things to learn. And they're not that difficult if you give yourself time to self-study. Aside from practical things like the places you want to visit, the language, the law. I think it's really important to try your best to study the history and the culture of Korea, Um, especially if you're an American citizen. There's a lot of stuff that I think our education systems don't really cover. Like the Korean War, I don't even remember really learning about that in high school in any history class. There isn't much focus on World War II for Korea in our education as Americans, I think. And that's definitely a pretty recent moment in time, you know, that the U.S. and Korea have had history with one another. Even now, the geopolitics between the U.S., Korea, and the Indo-Pacific region is very influenced by the U.S., and so those are things that I think, out of respect, you should try to understand, try to look up, so that you know, as an American, then let's say, what is the relationship that you have with Korea or that Koreans might have with you? You know, we're talking about historical, political context, but again, also culturally speaking, you know, why certain things in Korea are the way they are, why do they value these things, and even if maybe let's say they feel really uncomfortable for you or that you don't align, you still have to respect the fact that you are a guest in their culture and their society. So I think that's it. There was a lot of talking that I did, I know, but I hope this was helpful for you. I've packed up all of my food as you can see and I'm ready to go off and meet Allison and talk a bit further about more general things about studying abroad in Korea. Because there's CCTV everywhere. Because that's life or death that you're talking about there, you know? That I was like, what is this? (laughs) We're not even counting down anything. The beat didn't even drop. So please join me in that next video where I'll be meeting with Allison. And I really hope that this video was helpful for you. If there's other things that you'd like me to address, again, please let me know in the comments and I'll try my best to answer them. So thank you again for watching. I wish you the best of luck in your pre-departure stage for studying abroad, and I will see you next week for things while you're actually studying abroad in Korea. Thank you for watching!